This is the first lesson in the particle theory unit and we're going to start by looking at states of matter. So our first question takes us back to year seven and that is what is the difference between a solid, a liquid and a gas? And you may want to pause the video and see if you can think of some of the answers. Looking at solids first then, solids keep their own shape unless a force is applied to them. So as you can see from our representation on the bottom right there, if you were to have a beaker and place something solid in it, it would keep its own shape. In order to change the shape, I might have to hit it, squash it, stretch it, and so on. The particles in a solid are in fixed positions and they vibrate about those fixed positions. So they're very, very closely packed. There are strong forces keeping those particles in their place, but they are moving and that's very important to remember. Liquids will always sink to the bottom of a container and take the shape of a container. So if you think about pouring liquid like water into a cup, the water falls to the bottom of the cup and takes the shape of the cup. The particles in a liquid vibrate and the particles are still very, very close together. They're very closely packed, but they are able to swap places. So they're moving a little bit more quickly and the forces between those particles are a little weaker, enabling them to change places. A gas will spread out and take the shape of its container. So, for example, if you think about walking into a room, the air in the room fills the entire room, taking the shape of the room. And that's because the particles in the gas move very, very rapidly. They're very spaced out and they are moving in random directions and at random speeds. So thinking about the arrangement of those particles in solids, because the particles are so close together, they are incompressible. So it's very difficult to compress anything which is solid. Gases, on the other hand, are completely compressible because their particles are so far apart. If you compress them, you're just pushing those particles closer together. Liquids are also incompressible. There's a slight amount of compressibility, but we call them incompressible because like solids, the particles are so close together. One of the main mistakes people make when they're drawing diagrams of liquids is to show those particles further apart than they ought to be. They are still pushing against each other. They're just spaced up enough that they can change places. So liquids are incompressible. The other thing we ought to revise from back in year seven is the names of the processes where we change state. So if we start from solids and work to the right, if we add heat energy, the solid will eventually melt and become a liquid. So the bonds between the solid particles will break so that they're able to swap places. And that's how we go from solid to liquid. That's how we melt. Going from a liquid to a gas, then the particles are completely breaking free of each other and then they spread out to form a gas. And that process is called vaporizing. Going in the other direction, if we remove energy, cool something down, the gas will condense into a liquid. The particles become very close together again and the forces between them are stronger. The liquid particles are now very close together and only able to swap places. If I continue to remove energy and cool it down, the liquid will turn into a solid. That's the process called freezing. And now the particles are only vibrating around a fixed position. Up to now, we've not really used the term vaporization. We either talk about boiling or evaporation when we mean changing from a liquid to a gas. Those two processes are slightly different. So boiling is a rapid process and always occurs at the boiling point. So you have to get water to 100 degrees Celsius if you're going to get it to boil and change from water to water vapor. Evaporation happens at a much lower temperature and is slow. So if you think about a puddle evaporating, then you don't need to get that water up to 100 Celsius for it to evaporate. It can happen at much, much lower temperatures, but that process takes quite a long time. Let's try to put some of these ideas together now. So I'd like you to imagine you're in the lab. I've given you a beaker full of ice and you're heating it on a Bunsen burner. You take a thermometer and get the temperature every, let's say 30 seconds. And at the end of the experiment, you plot your results. You're going to get a graph that looks a little bit like this. 
So when we start off down here, the ice is less than zero degrees because obviously it's not yet melted. As I heat it up and add heat energy, then it's going to get warmer until we hit this point here where we're at zero degrees. Now at zero degrees, we know the ice is going to melt. And yet at this point, we've got something different happening because the temperature isn't going up at all. It's staying the same. So what's going on here then? Well, as we add more energy, instead of making the ice hotter, it's actually breaking the bonds between the molecules or the particles. Those particles are now able to move past each other and that's how they turn into a liquid. So where this graph is horizontal in the stage where it's melting, we're adding energy, but instead of making the ice warmer, it's breaking the bonds between the particles. By the time we get to this point here, then all of those bonds are now broken and we have liquid. As I keep on adding energy, then the liquid just keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter until it reaches 100 degrees, which we know is the boiling point of water. Now, at this point, we get a very similar thing going on. So here, the temperature isn't changing, even though time is going on and I'm still heating that water. Again, at this point, the energy isn't making the water hotter. It's breaking the bonds between those liquid particles so they can escape and go into the atmosphere as water vapour. Eventually, when we get to this point here, all of the water has now turned into a gas. And at this point, there's no more water to boil. Now, theoretically, if I keep on heating, then the gas is going to get hotter as well. Now, obviously, we don't do that in the lab because we're just heating gas in a glass jar. But in effect, what was happening here is the gas would then keep getting hotter and hotter and it will keep going for as long as we could keep heating it and it could keep getting that temperature up. So to summarise, where the graph has no gradient, then the substance, which here is water, will still be heated, but it's not getting any hotter. That's because the heat energy is now breaking bonds. That's the key thing. So it's enabling that substance to change state. So where the graph has no gradient, we're either looking at melting or we're looking at boiling. OK, I'd like us to have a look now at how we'd use the information in a typical exam question. You'll notice here that you're being asked to use good English, organise information and use specialist terms where appropriate. So what they're really trying to find out is can you explain yourself clearly? It then tells you to have a look at the information in the box. And you notice here it mentions solids and it mentions gases, but there is no mention of liquids here. At the bottom, then, it asks us to consider the spacing between particles. It asks us to consider the movement of particles and it asks us to consider the forces between the particles. So I've highlighted this information because this is going to help us put our answer together. So here we're asked to use our knowledge of kinetic theory or particle theory to explain the information in the box. So we're asked to explain why solids have a fixed shape, why they're difficult to compress, why gases spread and fill an entire container and why they're easy to compress. And you'll notice as well that there's a total of six marks. So we need to make sure we say six different things. You can see here I've taken the information from the question and then organised it in a table. We've already spotted that the question asks about solids and gases, but not liquids. So the first thing I'm going to do is put aside any information I have about liquids because it's not going to get me any marks. You'll also notice in the question we were asked to talk about the spacing of the particles, the movement of the particles and the forces between the particles. So what I've done here is organise a table so I can look at solids and gases separately on those three different things. So for solids, we know the spacing is that they're closely packed. We know they move by vibrating around fixed positions and we know there are strong forces between the particles. If we go and have a look at gases, we know the particles are spaced out. We know their movement is fast. It's random speeds in random directions. And we know there are very weak forces between the particles and gases. And as you can see now, I've got six different things to say, which means I can now address the six marks asked for in the question. And so finally, I've turned that table into a written answer because it does say in the question that we have to write with good English. So they want it to be clear.
So having a look at what I've said here, in solids, the particles are packed very close together. There's my one mark there. They vibrate around fixed positions. There's my second mark. And strong forces hold the particles together for a third mark. And to make sure it reads properly, I finished off with this is why they have fixed shapes and can't be compressed. For the second half of the answer, looking at gases, I've mentioned here that the gases are spaced very far apart. There's mark four. I said that there are only weak forces for mark five. And for the sixth mark, I've said that they move very fast at random speeds and in random directions. And to make sure that the answer reads well, I've said here space very far apart, which makes them easy to compress. And then mention later on that they fill any container. That way I've got all six marks. I've addressed what it asked you in the question and it reads well.